the first two webinars um, also had to do with this idea of partnering for sustainability, with the first one being specifically about developing your strategy where uh, we help you to use tools to identify partnerships. And then uh, for the second of the series, uh, that was titled Engaging Policymakers, and we discussed approaches to creating relationships um, with policymakers. And for the third one, which is today, um, we'll hear from three Gateway to College directors who have been successful um, at uh, garnering additional supplemental funds to help keep their programs viable. So some of the outcomes for this uh, webinar is to identify skills, tools, and resources needed to access supplemental program funds and to provide tips and tools for accessing and, and writing grants. And then the third one is to provide the space to have your own questions get answered. So what I want to do is take a quick temperature check. Um, and what I've done is created a poll uh, that has two separate questions. And for those folks who um, have access to your computers, what I'm going to ask you to do is, in response to the, the first question, it says, on a scale of one to three, rank yourself in response to the following question. Is program sustainability uh, a concern for you? Um, and so let's go ahead and launch the poll. And for those folks with access, can go ahead and uh, respond. So it shows that 87% of you have uh, voted. So go ahead and uh, take another couple seconds and uh, log your thoughts with regard to that question. All right, so here's the poll results. Looks like 23% of you said that program sustainability is a minor concern, and 77% uh, of you said that program sustainability is a major concern. So that is, uh, that is definitely uh, noteworthy. Um, so let's talk about uh, funding and what needs that are addressed through funding. I'm wondering if you could tell me, since we're talking about funding, what sort of um, supplemental funding, funding uh, and needs does the funding help you to address? All right. This is Vivian from Holyoke. Um, the particular grant that we got um, allowed us to address a need that um, I know is big in our area, and I imagine is big for some of the rest of you as well in that many of our applicants aren't reading at the eighth grade level. So we were um, sending away about 70% of our applicants simply because um, on our first round of training, they weren't reading adequately. And so um, this particular grant that we got allowed us to reach the students reading at the seventh grade level. So um, students who were otherwise good candidates for the program but just didn't have the literacy rate, we were able to bring in for a, quote, gateway prep semester to get them ready for a regular gateway. When I look at supplemental funding, um, I, I look at it from a, you know, several different perspectives. Um, when I became director of the program, of course, we uh, were in a bad situation. Um, we were about um, half a million dollars in debt, and we had no partnerships. Um, so the supplemental funding um, was definitely necessary in helping with staffing um, as far as instructional staff as well as resource specialists and um, my fiscal specialists. Um, from the second perspective, um, I looked at supplemental funding um, not just as far as money but with also resources. So we, as we massaged the data and we realized that our students were really failing in math um, we decided to connect with those programs that provide um, supplemental tutoring. Um, like I mentioned before, we partnered with the chess club to, to teach mathematics through chess. Um, I also realized that I didn't have very many, uh, I didn't have a, a resource specialist at the time and I needed some real crisis counseling. So I began to connect with area universities, for example, University of Missouri-St. Louis. 
and um, uh, with the Division of Counseling, and they would actually bring counseling interns to our program, and they would provide some group uh, therapy as well as uh, crisis and individual counseling. I appreciate that, and uh, I think um, what was sort of hidden in your response window was the fact that we're talking about funding, but I, I think it's important to highlight the fact that you're also talking about resources other than funding. Right. And I, want, right. and I wonder if you could share sort of uh, your philosophy, your philosophy behind that, because if we think of funding, it's more narrow in scope. But uh, I think what you right. pointed out. Uh, is a little bit broader than that. It is. You know, there, there, of course, there's soft money, um, you know, actual tangible resources. Um, and I realized that I, I didn't have the staff that I needed um, to necessarily uh, impact our student challenges. And so, you know, as I looked at the data, of course, it's data-driven decision and uh, decision making. I realized I needed a certain ratio of number, uh, of a certain number of staff. So it was, a, let's say, a, maybe a one to eight, one to ten type of ratio for our students to have um, some of that contact. Um, so I said, well, I don't have the funds to hire all of these people. Um, so I began to start brainstorming and start thinking about what can organizations provide our organization? I mean, let's let's tap into those organizations that do a particular thing well. You know, it's like if you read the book Good to Great, we talk about the hedgehog concept, focusing on those particular organizations who provide a particular service. So we developed articulation agreements with those organizations, and we connected our students to that particular service. Uh, like I mentioned before, from you know St. Louis Chess Club um, to um, Better Family Life will come in and do parenting classes for us. Um, I would also say, like I mentioned, uh, University of Missouri St. Louis. Um, we've had the Department of Health to come in and do you know sexually responsible behavior and things like that. So the students got the actual. Um, engagement with caring adults, but I didn't necessarily have to dip into my budget to mm -hmm. pay them for a particular service. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that, those resources right there are just as tangible as money because that's providing the, the program manpower. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very important point, and um, I think that approach is within reach for everyone on this call, and again, it broadens the scope of um, what we mean by program funding because it, we recognize that our programs need resources as well. Uh, Connie, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you and ask you similarly, um, what are some program needs that uh, supplemental funding help you to address? This is Connie Eichhorn in Metro Community College in Omaha. And basically, we needed funding for everything because we had nothing. We are a little different than most programs. We did not have gateway or startup funds. Ours was all done locally. So we have had to go after everything. Mm -hmm. And you know, this next question is, um, it actually goes hand in hand uh, with one of the questions that one of the panelists asked of Vivian. Um, and the specific question was, uh, can Vivian say a little bit more about uh, what type of funding she's received? Um, absolutely. Hello, everyone. So um, the, where we got the funds for this year is a, a project called the Vision Project, which is um, a Massachusetts funding source. And so um, we applied. And this is one of those case stories where the Vision Project made a big deal about um, there's the, kind of the day that the grants were released, and so there was this headline that Gateway at HCC had received $165,000. Like, oh my God, the crowd goes wild, right? Except I hadn't even applied for anywhere near that much money and had no idea what they were talking about. 
So what they had done as the vision project was to give the amount that the campus had given. Now within that, we got about $50,000. And which enabled us to do amazing things in terms of offering classes, doing incredible support in terms of particularly learning coaches and being able to do, Jada still does the wraparound services of a resource specialist, but we're mo much more proactive about you know, student needs. So um, the other piece of that is other folks who got Vision Project money, a lot of those folks are doing things like developmental English and developmental math. So this was a pathway for us to have connections with each other. I'm done. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, anybody else, uh, Connie or Window, want to respond to that? Yes, I would like to respond to it. Our original funding came from the local school district. It was ARRA funding. And that took us through about a year and a half. And since then, we have had a philanthropic foundation local uh, who has funded us. Thank you. Okay, for us, um, initially, um, like I mentioned before, we had no partnerships um, in 2009. And one of the ways we were able to rekindle our partnerships with certain uh, school districts, we worked with those school districts who hadn't met adequate yearly progress. And then we received funding uh, from the school improvement grants. And uh, those school improvement grants were for three years. Uh, we've also received corporate funds uh, from City, uh, Express Scripts, AT&T, American Express. And we've also received um, private uh, foundation money from Spirit of St. Louis, um, Beyond Housing, and we've also served on um, the Governor Jay Nixon's dropout prevention task force, which we were able to receive a few dollars for. So uh, we, we've definitely diversified money. We've received it from private, uh, public, um, as well as even tapping into our own K-12 partners and figuring out what type of grants um, they would receive to help supplement our program. All right, and I think the, one of the important things that you mentioned was diversifying, and so not really relying on, you know, one or two sources, but really spreading things out a little bit. Absolutely. And I, I'm going to remind the panelists, though, if you have questions as we're going through this, um, uh, please feel free to continue to use the chat panel. Um, so let's narrow things down a little bit and talk about um, how you determine what individuals or agencies to target? Well, I'll start. Um, I looked at my service areas um, of my partners. I looked at all of the corporations in our service areas. I focused on, A, did they have a foundation? And what types of programs did they tend to fund? Um, again, so you have to start by doing your due diligence. Um, you always go in thinking what's in it for the corporation or the agency. And so I go in and figuring out the win-win approach. Um, and so, for example, um, one of my partners, which was Express Scripts, decided they only wanted to fund students from my Normandy school district and they were interested in kind of creating this pipeline for health careers uh, for students, underrepresented students. And so, you know, I pretty much focused my, uh, my grant on um, helping some of those students who are interested in health careers to get into Gateway to College. Um, and then I did the same thing for other corporations. There are certain groups that want to fund a particular area or a particular school district, um, but you can't figure that out unless you, you know, you do your due diligence and kind of figure out what's their interest. You know, some organizations like Edward Jones are interested in funding students who are interested in business and marketing and management. And so um, we just provide scholarships to school districts from those particular service areas mm -hmm. and uh, again we, we provide them that data on how well they do after that. Right. 
And um, and uh, one of the points that you mentioned was uh, looking for opportunities where there's this win-win uh, for both parties, both you and the, the organizations who are providing the funds. And uh, so, um, what what are the how do you make that determination about the win-win element of it? Um, well, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was I was just going to basically say you kind of look at the corporation first. I mean, I think you should know more about the corporation than the corporation knows about you. And you know, there is this move uh, for workforce development, and you know, basically, my whole approach was. You know, you can be on the cutting edge as far as organizations who are providing workforce development and that are addressing the dropout crisis. And um, basically, we're creating human capital. Mm -hmm. And ho hopefully these students, you know, will one day, as a result of your intervention, you will be able to one day hire, you know, as gainful employees. Mm -hmm. And um, it just looks well to their bottom line. It looks good for their bottom line, you know, if they are on the ground floor at trying to help those disenfranchised populations. Right. And I think most organizations are going to receive that well because, of course, uh, these organizations, a lot of times they get tax abatement um, in, in, service, in certain service areas, especially in urban communities. Mm -hmm. And so they're charged with the responsibility of giving back because many of them don't really pay taxes, for example. And and so, again, it's almost like you're obligated um, to provide some type of service. To and I, I, this, I, I, this is I, Connie. Oh, this I is Connie. Gonna, I, I agree. Ahead, I agree with Wendell that you really need to get to know the groups that you're going to be speaking with. If you're working with a foundation, you need to know what the mission is, the vision, what kinds of projects have they funded in the past, their timelines for when you need to submit, what do you need to submit? Is it a full-blown full blown proposal? Is it just a letter of inquiry? And then developing relationships with individuals that are um, involved in these different places. I think the relationship building is really critical so that you develop your own credibility, your program's credibility, and things like that. So at the heart of it all is the relationship, in addition to finding out exactly what it is a funder wants and what types of things that funder has probably funded in the past. Thank you, Connie. Uh, Vivian, what are your thoughts? Um, much on the same lines as Connie. Um, as I hear Wendell talk, I realize he's much more expert at this than, than I am. And it, my role in all of this granting has been to tell the story of Gateway to everybody who will listen at every moment that they will listen, listen, and to make particular friends with the Vice President for Development here at the college and the Dean of Resource Development. So always putting our story in front of them, our need in front of them, our, um, our kids in front of them, and then their story gets told on the website and in the news, et cetera. The other piece that's really helped us is that our campus priorities um, Last year, our top priority was the recruitment and retention of students from underrepresented groups. And then this year, that's modified to students from underperforming groups. Well, our students fit the bill on both of those places. And so um, my role in terms of relationship is to make sure I'm at the table all the time, at the trustees meetings, at the long-term long planning committee meetings, wherever discussions are happening about what's what's going on about what's happening with Gateway and how what we do augments what the campus is really trying to do and then what do we need in order to support that vision. So I've not yet written a grant, but boy have I tried to be inspirational for the people who are doing the writing. Mm -hmm. But you but your actions have led to additional uh, some significant funds for your program. So I think that's great. And so what I what I hear you saying is Definitely be, be involved in those discussions. Uh, get the message out about who you are, the students that you serve. Um, know the funder and what their interests are and where they're looking to provide funding. And I think that's the win-win that uh, Wendell referenced earlier. Um, and then relationships. And quick, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to make a quick um, piggyback on Vivian's comments. I think, although she may not have written the grant, 
I think it's very critical. Um, like, you know, one of my mentors always told me it's not about what you know or who you know, it's about who knows you. And when, when Gateway to College becomes a kind of a household name, um, many of those RFPs just kind of fell in my lap. So as I served on certain committees, as I served on certain task force, as, as people begin to hear about the model in and of itself, they say, I want to help or I want to support. And so people would send me, hey, State Farm is having this. Or I'm not saying that I got funded for every project. But, you know, in addition to our executive director of our foundation, I had other people out in the community kind of looking out for our best interests. And so, again, like Connie and Vivian mentioned, it's about building those relationships and making those connections and being a part. I think as a gateway to, gateway to college director um, who is – kind of focusing on sustainability, you can't really create a sustainable program in your office. I mean, you have to get out in the community and make yourself known. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that was the, the, uh, the comment of the webinar. You can't uh, create sustainability sitting in your office. That's, uh, that's great. Um, and you know, this relationship piece, Wendell, when we talked the first time, um, you know, and the relationship that we focused on was the, the VP of uh, grant development. Um, and one of the things that uh, struck me when we had that conversation was that when you develop that relationship, it's almost like an extra set of eyes because you mentioned right. during that conversation, now you're getting emails saying, hey, what about this? This sounds good. And these are oftentimes right. things that you're not putting energy and effort into uh, identifying, but you're showing up in your email box because of that relationship and someone else's understanding of uh, what your needs are. I, I, you know, you're so right. And I, I, I tease our executive director of our foundation. It's almost like we have a, a marriage. You know, <laughs> it's one of those things where we are truly partners. And as she can... She dedicates a certain amount of energy and time to our, our program. Mm -hmm. And those, you know, it just helps me because she knows what we're looking for. She knows what, what type of funding we're looking for, what type of support we, we're looking for. And I initially, I had to do the research for the RFPs. I don't have to do that anymore. Um, it's pretty much, okay, when do I need you to write this? You know, I'll focus on our financials from the foundation. You just, you know, do the programmatic piece. We come together, and uh, we've had a pretty good success rate. That's great. So um, we have a question from Ms. Sharif, one of our participants, and uh, her question is, is there a listing or website of organizations that provide funding to DTC-type programs? I'm specifically looking for uh, uh, funding for textbooks. Um, and I'm going to share a few websites at the end, but um, wanted to know if, uh, our panelists had any thoughts about that? Walmart is good for funding textbooks. Um, there are so many websites. Um, you have um, nonprofit programs. Nonprofit Missouri, for example, they'll send me RFP alerts. Um, uh, I don't know if your college has an issue with partnering with certain organizations, but Target, they'll fund uh, textbooks and notebooks and pens and pencils, mm -hmm. those types of things. But there are a variety of different websites that are available. You can get on kind of this kind of listserv kind of um, programs, and they'll just give you RFPs, and you just apply what you think apply for what you think is relative to your program. Mm -hmm. Grant Station is another one. I'm sorry, Grant Station is another one. Mm -hmm. Connie, did you have some thoughts on that? Well, sometimes just using your college bookstore and the, the various partners and or major publishers that they use will um, sometimes work with you. So I've had a little success doing that, talking with them and getting either discounts or uh, free materials. So that's another way to go. Uh, I just want to so, make one more comment about that last question. Sure. I think I think it's it is important that directors don't limit themselves on the type of funding they go after. 
don't be afraid to go after grants in excess of $100,000. I mean, many times if you haven't had success at going after those, it, sometimes we're intimidated by doing that. And then also focus on making those relationships with those partners where you can determine where, the, where the, that funding goes. For example, um, you know, if Express Scripts gives me $40,000, they don't really tell me where I have to spend it. And so I can add it to whatever line item on my budget that I, I need it. So if I need textbooks, you know, I'll, I'll shift a certain amount of, amount of money for textbooks. Um, but I don't like to be pigeonholed and say I can only write four textbooks or I can only write four pens or I can only write four supplies. I encourage those funders to allow us to, to give us money for general operation costs. And you as the director can kind of decide where that money goes. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Um, so let's just keep it moving. Uh, what are your thoughts about characteristics of a successful proposal? This is Connie. I think that you have to be really, really careful and, as I said, uh, pay attention to deadlines. Pay attention to writing exactly the way the, the funder wants things done. Most of them have very specific protocol. Sometimes you're able to get sample grants from different uh, groups that have received funds. So I think you have to be very, very careful and make sure that um, you have several people proof it so that it is saying what you want to be said and that you are working with your grants office and or your accounting people so that you have all your ducks lined up. Abs absolutely. And you, you, you also have to be uh, careful of not sharing too much information and not enough information. Um, when writing a grant, you have to be somewhat generic to a degree, if that makes sense. Also, celebrate your successes, but don't be afraid to discuss your challenges at the same time. Because if you discuss your program too successfully, nobody's going to want to feel like you're even in need of any funding or any support. Mm -hmm. So you have to be honest. You know, be honest and let them know, hey, we're, we're doing this well, but we can do some other things better if we have the support of your organization. And here are our challenges. This is what we face every day, and this is why we're seeking support. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any additional thoughts, Vivian? No, sir. All right. We just got a comment. Um, Juanita Como from Madison sent me a list of uh, potential funders for pre-college programs via email. Um, so I'll be glad to share that out um, after the call. So let's dig into some of the skills that you put in place in order to seek, apply for, and uh, being successful. And you know, um, when it comes down to skills, what are those things, what are those skills that you're using in order to, to, to do that? And, and be thinking about uh, some of those folks who are on the call who have, uh, have never been successful at accessing additional funds for their programs. Well, I think one, one skill is make sure you ask other people for help. You can't do it all by yourself all the time unless you're really, really experienced in writing. So don't be afraid to reach out to others, whether it's your foundation office, your grant people, or people who work in um, grant-funded proposals throughout your college. You know, Talk with them and see what's worked well. Um, I think those are some of the things that you need to do. In addition, you, you have to be able to do your research and pull your data together and be very clear in your communication. But don't go it alone. Ask for help when you need help and where you need help. Mm -hmm. So Connie, um, ask for help. Uh, do your research. Uh, make sure you have accurate data. Are there other skills that you employ? Well, absolutely. That that really Absolutely. I think the relationship building and getting to know as many people in different places as you can, as well as your grants and foundation people, um, is critical. So um, I think, again, 
all those kinds of things come together and being very succinct when you're writing, just the host of things that you need. Um, I think there are lots of skills that you can employ. We all have them. Sometimes we haven't developed some of those skills as much as some of our other skills. So mm -hmm. it takes some practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Vivian? For me, it's all about relationships, as I said before, um, and essentially encouraging the entire campus to have ownership for Gateway to College so that we are the, the group. When people want to partner, they see us as someone that they want to come to to partner with. A little while earlier when I was on mute, there was a knock on my door, and it was the president of the college coming in. He had read something. He was, are you on mute? Um, he had read about some grant that he wants us to apply for, so he took a walk down here to tell me about that. And that's like gold to me, having the administration see Gateway as something that they, that's theirs and that we need to do a good job with. Mm -hmm. But there, was, there are some skills that you used in order to help get from where you were to where you have administration walking to your office and presenting you with potential opportunities. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that comes out of uh, sort of, uh, as you uh, alluded to earlier, about getting the message out far and wide. Um, am I, am I uh, that, in the ballpark that, that, there? That, that's exactly right. Okay. And it, I call it, it's our relentless PR campaign. We do three graduations a year. We do one in June, one in August, and one in January, partly because kids are finishing, but partly because we want a reason to have that out there for the campus. Uh, we're always telling people our numbers. Um, as I said, I am always going to meetings. I want people to know that Gateway is everywhere. And not only are we everywhere, but we're really graduating students, and those students are coming to our community college. We were, we were responsible for a pretty big bump in students of color enter, are entering class this fall. That matters to this institution. And so building investment on all layers to support what we do so that there's a shared sense of who we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear internal marketing in there. I hear a lot of that, that internal marketing. That's right. And put yeah. relentless in front of that. Relentless internal marketing. Relentless internal marketing. Internal marketing. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Wendell, your thoughts? I think, um, I, of course, I echo uh, the comments that are made um, before. But if I can add, strategic planning. Um, I think we don't think about, for example, sustainability um, when we're in trouble. You know, we're, we're usually reacting to a crisis. And I think to begin to forecast and think strategically, you know, looking at your budget, kind of seeing where you'll be um, the next year, next fiscal year, uh, next academic year, so to speak. And um, also um, the skills that I employed was definitely from a nonprofit-based focus, you know, pooling all of my resources together and strategically placing them in a particular order or prioritizing them in a different way. Mm -hmm. And uh, last, I think, just data, data, understanding your data, you know, understanding your budget, understanding uh, the college's overall budget and our foundation's budget. I think uh, many, many times directors are somewhat hesitant in going in, in that direction, but I think it will only give you pinpoint accuracy in where you can go and get funding and support mm -hmm. to understand your information. Yeah, I think that's really important. The, the point that you made about strategic planning and uh, understanding uh, your program's data and your, your program's budget, I think, are, are huge um, skills to be developed for, for some. Um, and then I would also offer up, and none of you have said this, but um, I think there's an element of bravery that has, uh, is unspoken in each of the the scenarios that you, you each provide. So I think bravery is definitely a skill as well. Yeah, absolutely. I always say be a wolf, <laughs> not a sheep. <laughs> All right, get that down. Get that down. Um, so this is share with us some approaches, tools, resources um, that you find useful in generating successful proposals. I know we talked about a few websites. Uh, we talked about relationships. 
Um, are there any other tools or resources? I'm going to share a few before we wrap up here. This is Connie. Sometimes I think your advisory committee, advisory committee people can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Critical. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're, uh, oh man, that's the, I, I'm, I, we didn't, you, we didn't really talk about that enough. Um, you know, having strategic people on your advisor committee um, that can help pool resources. I think Connie is right on with that. Mm -hmm. well, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I well, think I, you should have, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Connie. No, no, go on. That's right. We're probably going to say no, the same kinds of things. We're probably um, going to say the same thing, but I think in order to really have sustainable gateway models, I think you have to have people working on your behalf. In a, in a variety of different arenas. Sustainability is not just about money. It's also about political policy. It's, all, it's also about local governance. It's also about marketing and, and public relations. And so I don't have an expertise in public relations. I'm not a journalist, for example. Mm -hmm. So to have a connection with our community relations team on campus as well as community relations uh, teams um, either with print media or, or TV or radio, you know, they're critical. You know, um, again, the much, the the the, the um, as as much notoriety you can bring to your program. You know, if you only have two successful students, you know, showcase those students and use your advisory members to help you get it out to as many people as possible. Um, That's what I was going to say. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Connie. I'm sorry. Um, I think your advisory group people often have access to pools of teenagers or el possibly eligible students, whether it's with the organization they're with or whatever. So they can become a recruitment tool for you, too. So you have to think of them in many, many different ways. And marketing is obviously one of them. Um, the political kinds of things, uh, policy, furtherment, just a host of things. But they can be very helpful in the grant writing process, too, because some grants ask for the names of people who serve in advisory capacities. And sometimes those names wield some influence. Mm -hmm. As well as they may ask for letters of support. You know, Absolutely. Um, are, are they really performing what they say, they say they're performing? And, and if you don't have people to speak on your behalf, it'll be very difficult for you to get the type of funding that you're looking to get. Mm -hmm. Vivian, did you have any additional thoughts to add to this I point? Wanna, I want to go in one other direction with this, and I want to do a shout out to Niles and everybody on the data team at Gateway National. Because um, when I first came into this job, our data was a mess, and I wasn't able to defend the program from attack. Now our data is in pretty good shape and I can tell a story and I use that data all the time to either try to get money or just to tell the story or, and then to impact program practice as well. But for anybody out there, I would implore you to make sure, my colleagues tease me, I can give me a name of a city that we serve and I can tell you the graduation rates, the persistence rates, both the city <laughs> and ours. You know, it's like pressing a button. And so to have that, be able to put your hands on data that you can trust and then be ready to present it um, with every opportunity you're given. No, I think that's great. And um, it's, you know, we, we've always promoted the idea that, uh, you know, accurate program data is one of the keys to program sustainability. I wanted to rewind back just a, uh, uh, just a little bit. Um, uh, previously, uh, we mentioned the advisory board being a, a strategic group of folks. For somebody who is just starting out, what are some titles of folks um, that are on your advisory boards that um, are exempli that exemplify the example that you're trying to uh, portray? Well, as far as you know, we're concerned. I I don't really focus on titles as much, mm -hmm. but certain sectors. Uh, okay. Of the yeah, and it, you know, really just to give folks some flavor, so what sectors, titles, what types of individuals right, right. are on your advisory board? So we have people, for example, from community-based organizations, um, you know, executive directors of Better Family Life or uh, the Family Courts. Um, we'll also have liaisons from our school districts, so it could be an assistant superintendent or it could be a director of the alternative schools, 
um, someone that can provide us a snapshot at what's going on in K-12. You know, we may have an alderman or a committeeman, a Princeton committeeman on our advisory board. Again, somebody from media um, on the advisory board. Um, we'll, we'll have an attorney on the advisory board. We'll have an accountant on the advisory board. Um, a variety of different people, and I think you have to focus on like I said, the public policy piece, the lawmakers. You have to focus on someone from a, from a corporate environment, whether it's one or two people, maybe from Edward Jones, or it could be a partner, or it could be someone from HR. It really doesn't matter. Someone who represents that particular institution. Mm -hmm. And and I think the critical thing is to, is to give each one of those people strategic roles mm -hmm. uh, to play. Um, and I think many times we have advisory boards just because we should uh, for the sake of having one and we don't really understand how we can maximize their importance but I think when you have people from the community in your clutches I think you have to be specific at what you want them to do or they'll never come back again because mm -hmm. their time is very valuable yeah yeah so and that goes back to the strategic plan, uh, being strategic and, and planful about uh, your approach. Right. All right. So you guys have shared a lot of valuable information. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, there's a number of folks reported that they, they've never uh, attempted to garner any additional funds for their programs. Uh, so where does one, how does one get started? First step. At the beginning. First <laughs> <laughs> How do you get started? I think a critical mistake, I, I just wish if I could do it all over again, printed, mm -hmm. and of course some of this that I inherited. Mm -hmm. But I think don't wait until the midnight hour to begin to think about support funding. You know, I think if we would have began to think about supplemental funding maybe after year two, mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't be necessarily in triage mode or reactionary mode. Right. I think, you know, the critical piece is to be proactive in this. You know, don't wait until your well runs dry before you begin to even identify possible support funding uh, sources. Don't start building your relationship with your foundation now, um, you know, if you're a newer program, um, because it's really not fun to be, you know, playing behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very stressful place to be in. And, you know, um, I'm not saying that we're clear of that now, but we're in a better place than we were five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, every little bit helps. Every little bit helps. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, don't be afraid to go after the big pot of money and don't say, well, we can't do it. You know, mm -hmm. having those relationships with your business managers on campus, having your relationships with your senior administration, like Vivian mentioned, having a relationship with your president. You know, for example, our chancellor is writing and building relationships with the enterprise on our behalf. I don't have to write a grant for anything. Oh, so wow. try to get it. Yeah, so try to get in front of as many policy makers and decision makers as possible and, so to speak, kind of, I don't really want to say hustle them into working for you, but, you know, get them to do things for you that they wouldn't do for anybody else. Mm. Oh, wow, that's great. That's great. Uh, Connie and Vivian, any additional points that you want to add on to that? Well, it if you want to, you can talk with other directors who have been successful, and they would probably share some of the things that they've written to give you a sample of the kinds of things they do. So I think there's all kinds of possibilities. So get to know the organization with which you might be applying so that you really understand the mission and vision and what that group will fund. Some will only fund specific things. For example, they'll only fund pre-kindergarten kind of activities. So just make sure you know exactly what kinds of things are most likely to be funded and right toward that kind of um, goal for your program. And Vivian. 
um, the other piece is I would encourage folks to have a long-term vision. We're trying to work on a five-year plan about where we're headed and what we want to look like then, so that, as Wendell said, don't wait to the last minute to apply for the money. Also, don't wait to the last minute to have a plan about where you're going to need money in two, three, four years as you grow as a program. Awesome. So I'm hearing a lot of pro-action, uh, some research about opportunities, um, relationships with key people at your institution and in the community and at corporations. Um, and a lot of that, the, the plan starts with planning, um, having that long-term vision and that strategic approach to um, accessing additional funds. Did I miss anything on that? That's a pretty good synopsis. Looks good. Can I add one more one more thing to this? To, yeah, you to bet. This, just this, this discussion. Don't be afraid to have the courageous conversations. And I think when, when you, 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 you have to take on challenges head on and don't kid yourself. You know, as my students would say, keep it real. You know, um, be honest with yourself, be honest with your program, and be honest with those key stakeholders. Transparency works better. Um, than anything else. Thank you much. So you guys have shared uh, some tremendous words of wisdom, um, and I've actually gotten at least one comment in the chat panel from uh, Nikki uh, indicating how valuable the information is. Um, so now is the time for our participants to to go ahead and have their questions answered. Uh, Ms. Sharif, I see that your hand is up. Um, is that due to the fact that you have a question? Ms. Sharif, did you have a question? You're, you're online. OK. Maybe not. Um, any other questions out there before we uh, uh, move on into our days. All right, so I want to thank uh, you three for um, just doing a great job of uh, sharing some of your experience and your approaches uh, to what it's going to take to uh, begin to start accessing some additional funding for programs. We know that that is extremely important. Um, again, we're getting some comments via the chat panel that this, the information that you've shared is uh, very important. I mentioned that I was going to share uh, a few websites. Uh, one, Resource Associates and uh, Connie passed these along, but they offer uh, free grant writing assistance and a whole host of other services. Um, there's also the American Grant Writers Association. They provide online courses on grant research, proposal writing, uh, and grant management. Uh, and dummies.com has some free and effective tips for uh, writing grants. And then the last one on this list is the new USA funding. Uh, and there's online tools there to help you seek out and apply for um, pretty much uh, different types of funding that uh, have a pretty wide range. So. Um, once again, we want to thank our panelists, and uh, we want to thank our participants for your participation and uh, sticking with us. Uh, let's see, do we, it looks like maybe potentially have one last question. I just want to just encourage good everybody out there to be working on their um, proposals for the PLC for um, July. <laughs> nice plug. At Wendell's house. <laughs> Welcome to have you in St. Louis. I just want to say good luck to everybody. Um, you know, I'm available via email, uh, phone call, uh, like Connie mentioned before, if anybody wants some samples. Um, I have a plethora of grants here, <laughs> and we will be willing to share a few, of course, it's confidential. Um, so, you know, be careful in who you share that with. But if you want some ideas, I'll be willing to share that with you. And it's a painful process at times, but it's rewarding. So, and it can be done. Mm -hmm. All right. I think uh, Kent 
uh, finish up better than that. So thank you all. Enjoy your day. I appreciate your patience. And uh, go out there and uh, keep your program sustainable. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.